Hi there guys, welcome into my earth lodge. I'm sitting here doing a bit of twiddling at the moment and um, what I have between my fingers is the back strap of a deer. What that means is it's a portion of um, a membrane, fiber, fibrous membrane that you get off of what's known as the saddle which is the muscle that runs down the back of a deer and when you take it off and you dry it out what you get is you get the opportunity to take these nice long straight fibres um, you have to keep working them down and down and they'll go right down and they'll come become right small and the reason you need them small is when, you, when you're making something like a fine thread when you're making a fine thread such as this you don't want any lumps and bumps in it um, the reason I'm doing this is because I've just been working on a dagger over the last couple of weeks it's an interesting one it's a material called navaculite that's a stone which is a sedimentary rock and apparently this has come from this has come from Arkansas or Arkansas never know really how I pronounce that word it's got an ebony handle with a little piece of um, uh, mammoth ivory on the end so you've got uh, ebony and ivory navaculite and that's all glued together f as a dagger that was um, that's always the bit that I can do where things get tricky is when you start trying to think of a piece of leather that you want to use and this piece of leather is quite interesting because um, it's got an unusual crimping in it. And as the story goes with this piece of leather, uh, there was a there was a Russian ship that that sank to the bottom of the ocean. It laid there for many hundreds of years. I don't really fully know everything about it, but divers went down and in their exploration they found some leather in there, so they raised the leather up and. Um, the leather was something that became of an interest because of the crimping on the surface and it's like a diamond crimping and um, so this was put this was put forward to some experts and they were trying to find out how that was achieved and what they realized is that the leather had actually been inverted this way and then rolled between two tight rollers and so what that does is it pushes the grain into itself and nips it and crimps it permanently. And that would give you a roll in one direction. Then they would turn it to uh, so many degrees and then what they'd do is they'd roll it through the rollers again that way, giving you like that diamond pattern. So historically it's quite cool because um, as I understand things this technique had been forgotten and then was recovered from the sea and then they worked out after some deliberation as to how this has come together. So my plan is to make the sheath for the dagger out of that. And um, a few of the problems that I have is the fact that I've chosen not to use a metal needle and not to make and uh, not to use thread that I can buy from a shop but actually hand make everything now the problem with the needles you can hardly see it but that's a little piece of bone uh, no sorry that's a little piece of deer antler has got to go through this leather now that's never an easy task but one of the problems with this particular leather it's got no stretch in any direction it's thick it's quite tough um, and it doesn't look like a lot of fun to work with, to be quite honest. So, you couldn't just push your needle straight through because you'd break the needle. That used to happen to them in the Stone Age as well. So, what we have here is we have a little bone awl. And we're going to press that through. And as you can see, that's going through there. Spin that round a little, little bit because this needle has got to travel through here without too much abrasion and then be able to pull the thread through 
consistently without stressing that. And, I, and that's probably got to do that 50 or 60 times at least well maybe down each side so the cordage has got to be good the needle's got to be good the leather's got to behave itself there's quite a thing quite a lot that goes into it um, so in the first place this is the kind of stuff that I would normally be doing when I'm trying to make really nice artifacts um, that have some kind of historical significance to them um, as you can see every I don't know if you can see there's little teggles here what happens is when I need to add something in what I tend to do is like to keep everything wet I'll bring it down here a little so you can see we don't quite need to add in just for a second so push forward with my hand like that and that's stored a lot of energy in there push forward like that so that's also stored put my hand underneath roll it in and collect it and do that and then we collect up that gateway come back to this first one lock it come back to this one and do that and make sure this doesn't come to because this is all going to twist up as well so they can catch up in things particularly like this long black uh, haired sheepskin this one's now starting to need something so I'll go over to my stock and just pull one little fibre and I'll check it out make sure it's not going to give me trouble down the line by running it through my fingernails it's really light and then that is going to be introduced underneath there like so they're now sort of sitting together but not in together so we'll wet them and we'll roll that lot forward so now that's rolled as a pack which has extended the length of that and then we can come back to this and we can carry on And this is something that can actually take many hours um, when you're making bigger garments like clothing uh, the cordage is a major consideration and there are other fibers that we could be using it doesn't have to be um, the fibres from a deer, it could be things like nettle fibres, it could be hundreds of different things that you can get from nature. So when I'm making something like a knife sheath, I never, no never normally make much more than a metre and a half of cordage to go on a needle. And the reason being is um, because every single section of that cordage has got to go for a hole and if it becomes fragmented at any time then you're going to break your line and it would be a reasonable question to ask what does it matter if you break your line because then you all you need to do is put it back on a needle well excuse me that's not strictly true there are problems when you break your line and I'm going to show you why I'll just introduce that into the pack right, so I don't have to worry about that anymore incidentally what I haven't really shown you will bring you down here when you're looking at the detail of this right my left hand lives at the gateway where everything comes in here and when I have hold of this and I push it and I put all of them twists in the twists become the power the twists is what stops it coming undone so you're holding the first set of twists putting all the second set in then when you go like that 
this is locked into itself permanently it's the intricate detail sometimes now what I want you to look at is this needle if you can see see the needle just here what you there's a tiny little hole and when I first started before I put any cordage together all I did was sent that through the needle and then descended the cordage from that below because if you start trying to put that weight through the back of the needle then what you've got is you've got this club head at the back of the needle so when you start using it all you do is you pull the back end off um, which has happened many times and it was one of them things that a sort of light bulb moment some time ago where I thought okay um, I better focus on that and see what else I can do so now I try and make cord that will not break it's good for stitching it's balanced um, you can see all these I've got to come and trim them off however We're going to need to cut this and puncture it. So we have a bone awl for puncturing and we have an antler needle for um, stitching. We have a knife that we need to take care of so we don't knock it to the floor. And interestingly enough, I'm saying to you, I need a knife to cut the lever. Why not use this knife? Well, to that's a really good question. If I run that across my fingers, that will cut me to the bone. That's a fact, because of the natural serrations in that. Um, but when it comes, which is basically, it's not a slice, it's more like a saw. So it's not efficient and effective for this. When you look at a natural edge of flint, like this, where you can always see through it. That edge there is much, much sharper than the knife will ever be because I've invaded that. So what we need is we need to cast a sharp knife off of a lump of flint like this. Incidentally, if you look there, it's a little fossil. Um, just sort of helps sometimes to see these things so you can understand a little bit more about what flint is, where it come from. Anyway, damn it. Tie the leg pad up. I can do it. Pop that on there. What we're going to do is give it a smack just here. You can see it's sort of grey mottled material. That doesn't mean it's not any good. It's a little bit rough in the middle there, so it's not the best bit of flint in the world, but it's suitable. I'm going to send a flake right down the length like that. So what we've done is we've used this top and this surface here. Now we can make a choice. We could try and send another flake right down here, which is going to leave us an internal crest. We'll do that anyway. It probably won't work because there's a big lump here, but we'll give it a go. That worked out all right. But in fact, when you look at that, that's a nice edge all the same, so we've kind of got our knife. So what we need to start thinking now is where this is all going to sit. And I reckon that what we've got is we've got that sitting there like that. If I use my thumbnail, I'll go up here to here. And the same about that far away here. 
<coughs> and then what we'll do is come in a little bit and we'll travel all the way up and we'll pass the tail end of the knife and come right to the edge of the leather because what that means that's going to be the back of the scabbard in the front of the scabbard um, it's literally just needs a piece of leather covering it there when you think if we cut that out then what we can do is fold that over and that becomes a loop for the belt this is not the best flint blade I've ever used it is a bit on the blunt side But you get the idea, we'll try this one. Much purer piece of flint. So we have our two pieces of leather and we have our awl. So it's time to start trying to put some holes through these bits of leather. And we're going to be asking a lot of this little bit of bone because it's got a lot of work to do, to be quite honest with you. And um, it is experimental archaeology after all. These things don't have to be brilliant at what they do. Let's see if I actually, first hole... I've put a little, just taken the fine tip off of that slightly. And so now it doesn't want to work at all. You can actually see the bit of it still stuck in there. Um, so if we were doing this, this would then need to, this would then need to be abraded back in to a sharp point. And this is everything that people were going through for thousands of years to quite simply survive in life. I was going to go through both bits and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to make all my holes through the first bit. Then I'm going to pop it back on here, line it up and then I'm just going to mark everywhere so that I know where my holes need to be and then push that through and because we're expanding the hole so much we also have to be careful that we don't actually rupture the leather through the edge and tear the hole out because when you're playing around in this arena disappointments loom over you all the time and it's about being able to um, understand what might happen and try and reduce that. So in some respects this is quite a hard video to make and the reason being is because it's not hard, it's, it's not fast, it's not sharp, um, it's dedicated to detail um, following an ancient pr footprint and um, to make a film like that in the back of your mind you think well surely everyone's going to sign off because it's too boring to watch um, so generally I wouldn't bother making a film if I thought it was going to be too boring to watch but I am making the film so better stop whining and get on with it hey find with um, people who practice primitive technology if they're really into it 
and you ask them if they like stitching the answer they're going to give you is yes I love it I've always liked stitching things together it's wholesome you can play around with detail and so many different levels the kind of details that I'm talking about is the kind of material you might choose to uh, stitch with the type kind of leather that you might be using um, the stitch is very self um, it's all part of it's all part of the journey I've never been not interested in it even as much as the all if you look at this this all has uh, this little rotary cuff where the anchor that's the ankle um, of the animal and my hand is getting a little bit red in the middle but if I didn't have that section there and I had something that was not giving me the protection that that little rotary cuff has given me you'd have a blister in a minute and then it'd be unpleasant and I didn't come up with that idea the idea is something that um, was was a design which I was shown from a um, from a burial mound down in the Cotswolds it was a little sh piece of sheep leg bone and the reason I was showing it is because I was using a piece of bone didn't have that on and I had a damn great big blister in my hand and uh, this fella thought he'd be doing me a favour, the archaeologist if he actually shoe, if I actually shoe if he shoe me what they had in the cabinet which was somebody's um, tool from thousands of years ago that had an importance to the value that they decided to stick it in the burial chamber with him so, you know, it actually had a value. So off we go. We have about two metres of uh, sinew thread on a put onto an antler needle. And we'll try and stitch this up without actually busting the needle, which is a common flaw in um, working in this particular fashion. And then this stitching that comes up around the edge of the handle section that is going to eventually be the belt loop is purely decorative. I always think it adds something. I'm going to go through each hole twice so I get a crisscross pattern going on. It's coming along nicely but I'm not sure if I've made quite enough to get all the way home. So. If I'm going to need a little bit of luck on my side here, get home by the skin of my teeth. But as you can see, it looks quite nice with the double stitch through there. And then see if she fits. There we go. So that was a bit of a journey actually because um, I started the knife about two weeks ago. I've been so busy I haven't had the chance to actually sit down and do all the bits and pieces but there we have it. We have a Novaculite knife blade in an ebony handle with a mammoth ivory tusk hilt in a Russian designed piece of leather that was recovered from the Russian seas, all stitched up with the sinew from the back of a deer. Hope you enjoyed watching that. I know it was a bit of a slow burn, but um, <laughs> that's how I put my stuff together.
cheers guys if you enjoyed it hit the subscribe button and um i'll take you on some new journeys next time i can cheers for now